You know, I feel like we take the Switch for granted. Ever since its release, we have seen Nintendo pump out pretty franchise-defining games, whole new and unforgettable experiences for both lifelong fans and newcomers such as Animal Crossing New Horizons, Super Mario's Odyssey, Zelda Breath of the Breath, and Fire Emblem 3. The chances of that new first-party title being something wonderful is high. Not incredibly high, don't think I'd ever let Kirby Star Allies into my house, but at least higher than they were when Nintendo was still doing shit like this. The Wii U slash 3DS era had a serious emphasis on casual experiences this time around, because those who bought the Wii were families, the kind of families that see Mario, buy Mario, play Mario, and are happy that what they're playing is in the most basic sense of the word, Mario. And they really wanted these families to buy a Wii U. This can be seen with how Mario 3D World, much like the new Super Mario Bros games, only really featured traditional Mario elements for the sake of simplicity. But unfortunately, Nintendo also wanted other franchises to be more familiar to those casual markets, whether it was through character familiarity or genre simplicity. They weren't very outgoing to say the least. And because of this, many of their games during this era were just not interesting. Chibi Robo, Animal Crossing, Mario and Luigi, Pikmin, Luigi's Mansion, Kirby, all victims to this bland and friendly facade that Nintendo was so insistent on in an attempt to rope in those Wii era sales. But of course among all the crimes Nintendo committed during this era were sin and murder. I don't have the case for Color Splash. I paid a buck for this at a garage sale and I ain't paying any more than that. No, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that the Paper Mario series hasn't always had a rocky history. The first game was just a legally compliant sequel to Super Mario RPG. While A Thousand Year Door took that legal compliance and made the name Paper Mario mean something truly special. However, Nintendo decided to shake things up as soon as the third game in the franchise. Rather than being a turn-based RPG, it was now a side-scrolling platformer that still, somehow, managed to stuff in all the creativity and heart you'd expect from a Paper Mario title, with many even saying it has the best story in the series. It was an absolutely remarkable game, where in my opinion its biggest issue was that I have to use a sideways Wiimote to play it, and the last time I used that thing my doctor yelled at me. Now by this point in the series there was a bit of an unspoken rule, that being that the Paper Mario series was Mario's console RPG franchise, while Mario & Luigi was Mario's handheld RPG franchise. So when Sticker Star was announced for 3DS, it was confusing, but when it released, it was a painful kind of confusing. It had many legitimate design issues such as the battles having just about no reward, and its biggest issue was that it was one of the most bland games ever made. But at least, it was just a 3DS game, it's not like it was part of the main series. Oh no. From the moment it was revealed, it was depressingly obvious that Color Splash might as well be called Sticker Star 2. And when it released, it was better than Sticker Star, hell it was even borderline adequate. But yet again, battles reaped little reward in the grand scheme of things, and it was yet again bland. Following Color Splash, the screams from fans became louder than ever, begging for a return to form for the franchise, or to put it in simple words, a sequel to Thousand Year Door. And four years later, a new Paper Mario game was randomly dropped on Twitter to the reaction of, Heh, what? It certainly looked more interesting than the past few games, and even seemed to hint that some previously discarded mechanics such as partners, badges, and traditional-ish battles would be returning. But this put the game in an awkward position where it was constantly compared against Thousand Year Door, making it seem like people would only like it if it was exactly like that game, which I think is a misplaced sentiment. Given that the past two games were bad and the first two games were good, it was more so a search for promising gameplay mechanics and storyline, trying to hope that this next entry would also be good. To make it very clear, I do not like Color Splash or Sticker Star, but Origami King looked much more promising to me overall when I took it all into consideration, and I didn't want to use two past mistakes from an era long past to judge it before playing. I want to treat it as its own game, separate from the rest of the franchise. That means not expecting something like Thousand Year Door, nor expecting something like Sticker Star. For that reason, I'll only be bringing up previous titles not to argue that they should change entire game components, but instead to compare mechanics shared by the games that Origami King did better or worse. But speaking of doing better, yeah, the story is that. For the first time since Super Paper Mario, Bowser is no longer the antagonist. Instead, the villain is King Ollie, a piece of origami who wants to fold the entire world into origami. The main reason he wants to do this is because of the fact that someone scribbled on him, and because of that, he absolutely hates Toads. So I'd be willing to bet he's a pretty big Paper Mario fan. 
Mario, of course, then sets out on a journey to unravel the five streamers in order to access locations vital to the story and ultimately enter Peach's castle to fight Ollie. It's a pretty simple and silly base plot, but compared to the soullessness of Sticker Star and Color Splash's story, it gets the job done. So I'd call it good. However, to accompany you throughout the entire journey is Ollie's sister, Olivia, and in addition to her, you'll have a variety of other characters follow you around like a bob -omb, Magic Koopa, and an Explorer Toad that for whatever reason is not Captain Toad. I wouldn't call them partners, being that you can't control them during battle and they are only with you for the duration of the story where they're contextually important, so I think Companions is actually a more fitting name for them, but I actually enjoyed their presence as they added that little bit of extra variety, while with them each having their own personality and flair. Not to mention the bob in particular, named Bobby, is by far the most developed companion, maybe even character, in the game. The others don't really change much, they're the same as when you meet them as when you leave them. But when meeting Bobby, he's suffering from amnesia, and over the course of chapter two and a half, you jog his memory and learn of who he really is, leading to a legitimately interesting and surprisingly emotional character arc. But hey, nothing good in life goes unpunished. That's why there's memes in the game. Yeah, Origami King has an obsession with what I could only describe as lol random humor and meme culture. Humor is largely based around subverting expectations, giving us something out of left field in order to get a laugh out of us from a combination of wit and surprise. But Origami King has the Goombas say they're taking an L, or have the trees burst into song, and instead of laughing, I just felt like a f***ing child. The worst part is, there were actually some genuinely funny and clever moments where I went, ha. Huh. But I couldn't go as far to call the writing anything more than good when there's also moments where I went, I should really sell my eyes. But what is actually pretty good are the environments seen throughout the journey. Whether it's a resort in the sky, a Japanese themed amusement park, a desert bazaar filled with scams, or even just grasslands, they're all thoroughly enjoyable even when they're not the most creative and I think that's mostly thanks to how absolutely gorgeous this entire game is. Sticker Star and Color Splash had a bit of trial and error when trying to nail down the everything is paper aesthetic, but Origami King finally perfected it. Not only is the game wildly appealing to the eye, but every single piece of the environment truly looks like it's made out of paper. The walls, the characters, the water. Paper in real life doesn't even look like paper anymore, like I wouldn't even know what this is if not for the words on the back. But finally getting to how the game actually plays, the thing is, I don't like playing it. I know that may sound pretty harsh, but most of my issues come down to how the game functions mechanically. Let me start by addressing how the overworld works. Like every other entry in the series besides the one that gives me cramps, the gameplay is split between the overworld where all the story progression and exploration takes place, and the turn-based battles. While exploring, Mario's equipped with nothing more than his jump, his hammer, and confetti. The jump actually allows for much more platforming than seen in previous entries, which is cool, I like my limited but enjoyable Super Mario RPG style platforming, but the confetti exists to make sure you don't have fun. To put it simply, it's the replacement for the paint seen in Color Splash. In that disappointment, you would slam your hammer down on colorless spots, and once it was fully painted, you were rewarded with coins and cards. You had a limited amount of paint, and extra paint would be rewarded to you for bothering with battles, and I thought the actual way you used the paint was satisfying enough mechanically. Confetti, however, fills up empty pits that you can actually fall through and take damage from if they aren't filled, and it can be gotten from winning battles but oddly enough can also be obtained from hitting just about literally anything with your hammer. For whatever reason though, there's no audio indication letting you know that you've filled up your bag, making grabbing such an important item feel oddly empty. But since it's not enjoyable grabbing it, you're going to want to be conservative when using it. But when you actually go to use it, it's not obvious how much confetti a hole actually takes to fill. So when you come upon a big old hole, you throw it a few times, then slow down trying not to waste it, throw one more thinking that'll be good, shit. The confetti is tedious waiting for it to hit the ground, the confetti is boring to use, and most of all, confetti rhymes with spaghetti and I'd rather be eating some of that right now. The hammer though you use to first strike enemies as you'd expect, but in addition there's also these paper mache enemies that don't actually lead to turn based battles. Instead having the fight take place in real time and I'm not gonna lie I loved this idea. The fact that they're visually different from the origami enemies creates an obvious cue for the player that they can be handled with just a few swings of your hammer. And the best part is these enemies further the actual danger in the overworld. Something I always felt was off about the older games in the series was that there was just about no reason to have HP outside of battles. Because the parts were 
can get hurt while exploring were few and far between. But Origami King has the previously mentioned paper mache enemies, spikes, fire, other obstacles, and even the projectiles the origami enemies throw will now simply hurt you rather than force you to engage in battle like the older entries. Back to the hammer though, much like a real life hammer, its main purpose is for battling, but it's also for hitting people. You see, stuffed around just about every centimeter of Origami King's worlds are toads, either scrunched up or hidden, and you use your hammer to unravel them. A few are integral to the story, but for the most part they're just another check on the game's 100% completion checklist, along with holes filled, collectible treasures collected, and question blocks hit f***ing finally I've been waiting for that to be a requirement in my life. The collectible treasures I mentioned though are mostly found in treasure chests, while the stuff you'd actually want are found elsewhere, such as how the HP upgrades are just kinda randomly given to you, and the accessories and weapons are bought from shops, and to buy those you use coins. Now the thing about coins is in the past couple of games, they were an icon of flawed game design, being that coins were basically the main reward for battling and you simply always had way more than you'd ever need, thus making it so battles had no point. Before Origami King released, this was the biggest fear fans had, that there would yet again be an overabundance of coins, leading to battling being completely useless and unrewarding. And yeah, this game makes me feel like a f***ing billionaire. Literally every single thing gives you coins, and while early on the game puts some pretty expensive things in your path, making it seem like you won't have an overabundance of coins by the end of the game, guess what I had an overabundance of coins by the end of the game? I thought maybe, just maybe, I was too frugal with the coins. I rarely bought weapons and I almost never used them mid-battle. Maybe it's my fault that I have too much money. I thought that until I walked into the shop in Toad Town and noticed the collectible treasure that cost 70,000 coins and realized the developers also thought there were too many coins and added an arbitrary 100% completion requirement to make up for it. It's almost like the game is bad. Almost. Like how Steve Jobs almost lived. But finally getting to the actual turn-based battles, they all center around a central mechanic of twisting and sliding the panels placed around Mario in a limited amount of time, so you could do as much damage as possible within your limited amount of turns. You're equipped with your jump and your hammer, both unlimited, but you also have accessories to boost your stats and weapons for more powerful attacks. And I like the concept. That right there? I like it. Don't like this though. To start, I actually quite like the idea of having weapons to aid you in battle, and the fact that they break after too much use gives extra incentive to make sure you use them carefully, but in execution I found that no matter how powerful they were, the enemies would either have been defeated by a simple jump or slam, or their HP is so high that it's going to take two turns to beat them whether I use a weapon or not, making an entire mechanic almost entirely useless. Coins, though, can be spent during battle to extend your time, which I think is a pretty fair trade-off, but they can also be used to have toads come in and help you solve the puzzle. Or, if you give them enough coins, solve the puzzle entirely, defeating the entire point of the battle system, which I don't mind, because this shit's boring. Battles taking forever was one of the major issues with Color Splash, and Thousand Year Door's lack of difficulty was one of its biggest faults too, but here the battles take forever, and you'll never die. Taking any damage in battle does not matter, because if your health is low, hell if your health simply isn't full, the game will suddenly throw constant hearts at you until you've fully recovered. But even without those, you're always going to have an overabundance of healing items. The fact that there's no fear of death makes the battles just feel like a waste of time, and I was so bored with them at a certain point that if I ran into an enemy I really didn't want to fight, I would just straight up reset the game because safe points are placed 5 feet from each other anyway. The game evidently doesn't care how boring I think these battles are though because throughout the entire journey, the game throws you into constant scripted battles against regular enemies. Now to make it clear, it makes sense for the game to force you into fights against bosses, and in previous entries it wasn't uncommon to be forced into battles with a common enemy, but for seriously just about every single thing, you gotta fight someone, almost like they knew you'd never engage in battle out of choice. However, the game has a secondary gimmick, on top of the already gimmicky battle system, that being the game's bosses. They were actually in some of the game's previews, showing off that instead of trying to line up enemies for powerful attacks, you would instead be making a path for Mario to get to and attack the boss. And when I saw this, I thought to myself, yeah, this probably won't make me suicidal. But this brings me to my main point. This is one of the most frustrating games I've ever played and for all the wrong reasons. Usually a game is frustrating because it's hard, or because it's unfair, or because you're bad at it, but numerous times throughout my playthrough I had to put down my controller and sigh, because the game wouldn't let me play it. 
To elaborate on that, each of the bosses have a specific way as to how the game wants you to defeat them, which would be fine and dandy if not for the fact that's the only way to defeat them. You're still given the option for regular attacks, but more often than not, you will be punished for attempting to use them, and that would honestly be fine too. But how the game wants you to defeat them isn't even obvious, so instead there's letters placed all over the battlefield to try to hint you as to how to defeat them, which only goes to show the designers lack confidence in the intuitiveness of these battles and just said, f**k it, here's how you win. The worst part is, this isn't even hard. I'm not dying, I never died on a boss. The only thing the game is taking is my time. Trying out different solutions takes forever and if you make one mistake when lining things up, that's just another turn you gotta wait. So these battles can legitimately take an eternity. And again, much like regular battles, there's no fear of death, because spread out among the battlefield in every boss fight are hearts that constantly respond just about every other turn. So as long as you always grab those, you are never going to die. But even outside of battles, there is one game-breaking gripe I have with this game. The text is too slow. You may be saying, Gons, that can't be game-breaking. It's just the speed in which information is being delivered to you through Westermonic language that was developed over the course of 1400 years and is currently a global lingua franca. How could that possibly be game-breaking? Well, as someone who learned how to read fast as a kid so I could get done with homework as fast as possible and play Pikmin 2, I am reading faster than the text shows up. Most games of this kind let you speed up dialogue, a lot of games in general do. Even the original titles in the series let you load up all the text at once with the press of a button. But there's absolutely no way to speed it up, and even then, once it's all there, it still makes you wait another half a second before you can start up the next box of dialogue. And the thing is, the big thing is, this wouldn't be so bad, the text being slow would just be a nitpick even, if Olivia didn't stop to talk to you after literally every single thing. I expected this game to have a slow start going in. Hell, even Paper Mario 64 takes a while to get going. But as I continued through the game, the start never ended. Every five seconds I would be stopped and told me either what I'm going to be doing or what I was already looking at, all at this unbearable text speed. Because of how scripted the entire journey is, watching someone play through the game would be no different than playing through it yourself. And the worser worst part is, in the final few hours of the game, I was kind of feeling it. It finally let me play the game without stopping me every second. I was able to feel truly immersed in the environments it was putting me in. I felt like it was up to me to explore and solve the puzzles. It felt like I was playing part of a really great game. And as I was watching the ending cutscene, I was honestly sad it was over. I wanted more of those last few hours, but unfortunately outside of those last few hours was a game with some good moments buried in overwhelming mediocrity. It would be dishonest to call this a bad game. I've seen way too many people genuinely enjoy the legitimately good things it has to offer to call it anything less than a good game. It's polished, it's playable, it hasn't killed my wife and kids, it has its moments, it's in the most generous possible sense, a good game. But I personally like the game as much as I like eggs. I don't like eggs.